Okay, I want to welcome everybody to Magnolia United Church of Christ February Learning Forum. And um, my name is Pastor Marcy, and I'll let you know that we are recording this tonight. We have many requests for this session for folks who had conflicts tonight. So um, we are recording it. Tonight, we're going to go um, probably for about an hour and 15 minutes because we're fortunate enough to have two speakers tonight. And um, we're going to have one session that is going to be informative and one session that is going to be a little more, I guess you say, virtual hands-on learning. Um, tonight, we are very honored to welcome back Stuart Rose and Amanda Stromborn with us tonight. Uh, Amanda and Stuart formed the nonprofit Vegetarian of Washington about 20 years ago. And it's grown to be one of the largest vegetarian organizations if the Northwest, if not the whole country. They have produced several cookbooks, uh, a book that explains the hows and whys of plant-based diet, and most recently, a medical textbook. They have a lot of information about all things vegetarian that they're going to share with us tonight. Tonight, Stuart is going to talk about the benefits of a plant-based diet, especially for the sake of the environment, the climate, and the animals, something that um, is near and dear to this community's heart. And then Amanda is going to follow up with a discussion on some different strategies on how to change your diet, including some easy recipes and cooking tips. Now, logistics for this evening. Um, please feel free to pop any questions you have in chat and we'll keep an eye for them. And uh, Stuart's happy to answer them as we're going through, especially as when we come to Amanda's section, um, it'll be um, interactive and um, you all are welcome to jump in with suggestions of your own and questions throughout, okay? Okay, that being said, uh, I want to welcome our first speaker tonight, Stuart Rose. Thank you, Stuart. And you are on mute, Stuart. You'll have to manual it. I, I muted everybody, so you'll just have to unmute. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you so much uh, for inviting us uh, to your church uh, over Zoom. and. Um, I will give some overview of um, the topic. It's a big, big subject. So this is just an introduction, but I think it will give you a good idea of just how important our diets are when it comes to uh, our environment, um, our health, and the animals we share this planet with. So let's get started. Uh, as you just heard, we're a nonprofit formed 2001, and we're over 20 years old. And uh, we have our festival coming up, VegFest. Uh, we think it's the largest vegetarian food festival in the country. And there's over 500 different kinds of food, all vegan to try. So if you come to VegFest on May 13th and 14th, don't eat breakfast because we'll have lots of food there for you. We have monthly catered dinners, all kinds of classes on all kinds of health, environment, um, and animal issues. Our books you just heard about. And so we've got lots of th different things that we do. And our monthly dining events are now in Des Moines. And so uh, in a fellowship hall, and that's working out very well. Okay, everybody is welcome to join Vegetarians of Washington. You don't have to be a vegetarian to join. We don't ask, we don't tell. Everybody just joins in, does the best they can, and we're here to help you along the way. Okay. So let's get some definitions. Uh, and one of the challenges with this is that there are there is no official body to say, this is what this means, this is what that means. Um, but with that being said, a vegan or total vegetarian diet is a diet free of meat, fish, poultry, dairy, and eggs. Some vegans also exclude um, honey. 
Uh, basically, if it comes from an animal, vegans don't eat it. A vegetarian diet is uh, free of meat, poultry, and fish, but uh, can include dairy and eggs. Can include, does it mean must include? It could be just dairy or just eggs, sometimes both. Uh, we're going to use the term plant-based diet to mean the same thing as vegan in this class. Well, what are the different reasons that people uh, make this change in their life and adopt this lifestyle? Uh, one is to protect our environment and save the planet. And when this is actually one of the most powerful reasons why, as you'll be seeing soon, to grow more food for the hungry. And we, uh, Amanda recently gave a speech on this. Uh, the problem of global hunger uh, doesn't often treat this as fully as it should. Uh, and the plant-based diet would actually make an enormous difference, allowing for all other factors, but even then uh, it would make a big difference. To reduce animal suffering, uh, animals are raised under very difficult conditions these days, harsh. To nourish, nourish our spirits, and a lot of people start down this path for spiritual reasons. And of course, last but not least, our health. It's um, been proven time and time and again that a plant-based diet is the healthiest diet there is, and the people who follow it are the longest living people in the United States, the, the vegans, and worldwide, the vegans are the longest living people on the planet. So something to keep in mind. Okay, let's talk about how our food choices affect the greater world around us. Here you can see United Nations says that livestock are one of the most important, significant contributors to today's most serious environmental problems. Urgent action is required to remedy the situation. That is no understatement. That is not, um, uh, excuse me, that is no overstatement. That is, it's, it's, the effect is enormous, as you'll be seeing. And so many people are unaware of it that, um, you know, that's a cause for concern. I will mention uh, leading the charge on some occasions is former Vice President uh, Al Gore when it comes to climate change. And he became a vegan because he realized that this was the situation. And so it has a major, major impact. Well, how could it be so important? How could it have such a major impact on the environment in which we live? Well, because you get ready for this, we raise 60 billion, that's billion with a B, farm animals every year on this planet, 60 billion. Now I think there's only about 8 billion uh, people on the planet. So you can see that their population far outnumbers ours. So of course, there's going to be a big effect. Also, the farm animals that we raise directly or indirectly use two thirds of the world's arable land. Now, um, to understand this, one needs to understand where our farm animals get their food from. In the United States, 70%, that's seven zero percent of all the crops that are raised are fed to farm animals, not human beings. Think about that one for a moment, okay? And rate, rate, and growing all that food takes a lot of land. And then, of course, there's the land that the animals take up um, in and of themselves. So the impact is very, very major. Um, and again, if anybody has questions, please um, uh, type them into the chat and they will be uh, relayed to me. Okay. Raising cattle is the primary cause of soil erosion in the United States. This is a silent crisis, soil erosion. 
And it's hard to get excited about dirt. We understand. But consider that if we lose the soil, we will not be able to grow food. Interestingly, the Dalai Lama considers soil erosion a bigger threat to humanity than nuclear war. It is a very, very serious problem. And the reason that's driving most of the uh, soil erosion is livestock grazing. And they go around and they uh, pull out the plant foods, grasses and shrubs and things as they graze up by their, you know, with their teeth, roots and all. The rains come, the plants are not there to hold the soil in place. And there you go. Also, farm animals consider that 70% of all uh, crops we raise are fed to animals. And with farming, even under best practices, you're going to get soil erosion. And in many parts of the world, they don't do best practices. They don't have um, either the knowledge or the wherewithal to uh, minimize soil erosion. So it's actually quite um, a problem and it's very hard to uh, reverse. It takes 200 years to produce an inch of topsoil in prime farmland and prime farmland in let's say Iowa. So we're losing this stuff way faster than it can be replaced. So this is um, something that people need to know about. And of course, this is one of the drivers behind um, global hunger because when the soil gets eroded, it's no good as farmland anymore. And this is something we wish to um, emphasize. It's not discussed nearly as much as it should be. Uh, some people think, oh, we could always um, have more farms, this and that. Actually, with the exception of the United States, all the good farmland in the world is already under use. Whatever is left is of poor quality. Uh, on hillsides, will there be even more erosion uh, or have other problems? Um, not enough uh, rain or up in Canada, it's too cold and the growing season is short. Um, so we really need that soil. Our lives literally depend upon it. And of course, all the ecosystem and all the animals that share uh, um, the world with us. Burning down the Amazon. The number one cause of burning down the Amazon remains uh, to have cattle to graze, and to grow crops to feed the farm animals in Brazil. The fires are so big in the Amazon that the astronauts can see them from space. And so this is a very uh, important environmental crisis. The Amazon is kind of a unique ecosystem. If we lose that, we're in trouble. And I'm afraid that the problem has gotten worse over the past five years or so as environmental policies in Brazil have been reversed um, under the government that's been in power then. We're hoping now it will get better again, but that's what's burning down. And of course, while that's happening, it's displacing the local populations. Where are they supposed to live? So just something to consider. The effects are so wide ranging. A study was done by the World Watch Institute, and this study was published in the um, sort of professional journal, Foreign Affairs. This is very serious. Livestock produce 51% of all the greenhouse gas emissions on this planet, 51%. The food you eat turns out to be more important than the car you drive, or whether or not you have insulation on your home and all these other which are good things to do, but food is number one. And um, this has been confirmed by various geophysicists and scientists throughout the world. Think about that. 
51%. Think of the 60 billion farm animals. Think of all the energy that has to be put into the equipment to uh, harvest all those crops. Think that meat has to be, and dairy and eggs really, um, has to be refrigerated or frozen to be sent to the stores, at the stores, and in your home, and everything is using energy. Um, so this is a really big um, issue. And I will um, go back and say, um, the UN issued another report that raising livestock causes more greenhouse gas emission than all the cars, trains, buses, planes, ships, submarines, you name it, and the whole world put together. The effect is so much larger than that of transportation. Now, this doesn't mean don't carpool. That is a wonderful thing to do. We have to sustain the environment, but um, don't underestimate the importance of the food on your plate. One of the other things we're concerned about is the oceans and covers two thirds of the earth's surface. And the way we fish in modern industrial uh, fishing is they put out giant nets, could be two, three miles long. And they uh, catch everything in sight. Now that's very disruptive of the ecosystem because you're catching a lot of fish that you didn't meet, need to catch, you don't want. Uh, sensitive sea mammals are also being caught up in these nets and dying, uh, dolphins, porpoises, and so forth. And so it takes out an entire trophic level, as you can see, depending upon the size of the uh, spaces in the nets. And so it is massively disruptive and it produces a lot of um, pollution. Dead zones um, are partly caused by just what you're seeing here. The other part is um, from soil erosion, from farms and from animal farms. Uh, animals produce a lot of waste products and nobody's been able to potty train them yet. So that all goes into our, our lakes and rivers. When it gets to the ocean, um, it can produce dead zones, which we have um, off the West Coast here. So that is a big problem. Um, and for those people interested in aquaculture or uh, uh, raising fish farms, shall we say, they're even more polluting, they're even worse. So, um, it's just not sustainable. Many of the fisheries in the East Coast are already depleted. Some scientists say that by the year 2040, the world's fisheries will begin the process of collapsing if we don't reverse this trend. So we can't just keep on pulling stuff out of the ocean. We don't think about it because it's out to sea and out of, out of sight, out of mind. From a spiritual point of view, we'll just quote from Psalms, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. We're caretakers and stewards of this world uh, from the point of view of many religions. And so it's not ours to abuse and mistreat, not the planet, not the animals on it. Uh, and many people bear that in mind. Following a vegan diet is a way of walking more softly on the earth, having a lighter uh, footprint in so many ways, even more than we can tell you tonight. But Stuart, before you go on, can you just um, talk about what sustainable fishing means and, and how, whether that's really sustainable or not? Sustainable fishing, I don't believe, has a legal definition. It's sort of like naturally nested eggs. Uh, it's a word you can say. 
I don't believe that it has any legal definition at all. There are some that claim to disrupt the ecosystems in the ocean less than others, but I'm not convinced, frankly, not convinced. If you're pulling that fish out of the sea, you're going to disrupt the food chain. Um, if you're using aquaculture to grow fish and then in a concentrated way and then release it into the ocean, that's actually even worse. So I don't believe that fishing is uh, sustainable. And keep in mind that the world's population is growing. And so the demand for fish grows with it. I'll just add that um, if someone were to ask me what it would be the first food to cut out when switching over their diet, what's the single most unhealthiest? Without hesitation, I would say fish. It's also the most unnatural for us to eat. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, advertising about fish and omega-3s. They all fail in scientific uh, examinations again and again and again. It's gotten to be so bad that in the American Journal of Cardiology, they said, this is getting embarrassing. Um, consider that we evolved, if you believe in evolution, from not only not land creatures, but arboreal creatures, creatures that come from the trees. So there you are swinging from tree branch to tree branch. Oh, tuna fish just happen to be flying across the forest. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. Uh, and consider how much technology we need to catch a fish, how helpless we are in water. Um, it's, it's, uh, we're land animals, and uh, fish is not natural for us to eat. And finally, the people who live longest in this world do not eat fish. All the health claims have so collapsed, you can check out our health classes. It's actually uh, a subject of particular concern for our organization, and we very carefully document all this. But it's a multi-billion dollar industry fishing, and uh, omega-3 um, fatty acids that come from fish is a giant industry, and it just flies in the face of the of the medical research that's out there. But once it becomes into the public mind, it becomes hard to displace. Long answer to a short question. I Did that do it? Okay, we'll move on. Amanda will tell you I'm not known for brevity. Let's talk about feeding the hungry. Between the years 2000 and 2050, of which 22 years has already been taken, starting 23, the global meat consumption will double. This world is eating more meat, not less. And you can see the illustration from this. This was also from uh, Foreign Policy magazine, that rice becomes progressively turned into a hamburger as a illustrative way of showing how the world's diet is changing. Uh, not as much quite in our country, but people have heard, for instance, um, about the Okinawa diet, which is largely a plant-based diet. And it used to be very healthy and the people there lived a long time, but they got exposed to McDonald's and all the other Western style foods. They are now the unhealthiest people in Asia. They went from the healthiest to the unhealthiest. Their genes didn't change, but their food did. And so um, this is a uh, problem. Also, a lot of people in a lot of countries think that they want to emulate or, or, or copy American lifestyle. It's very much desired in other parts of the world, eating meat. Uh, often confers a feeling of um, financial and economic accomplishment, and the middle class is growing, so more and more people can afford to buy um, meat. And yet, 
it's a big cause of global hunger. Mohammed Yunus, who won the Nobel Prize for giving microloans uh, to people in developing countries, has spoken emphatically about this, that um, the, the increased consumption of meat is driving global hunger. There are other things too, but this is a big one and in some parts of the world, the leading one. As you heard me say, most of the, we can't really grow that much more food with the very notable exception of the United States. Um, almost all the best farmland is already being used. What's left is less fertile or doesn't have enough rain or has too many um, uh, infestations. It's hard to clear, plant, plow. It's, they don't get enough water in Australia and it's too cold in Canada. And so we have what we have. The United States, while we live here, you drive, you could even drive down into Oregon on I-5 and you can see all kinds of unused farmland. This is most unusual. Also, the United States government maintains hundreds of millions of acres in a national uh, reserve, agricultural reserve, in addition to all the unused farmland. But in the rest of the world, it's a very, very different story. So while we experience this luxury locally, let's remember that globally, there is a farmland crisis. Uh, there are other fertile countries like um, Argentina, but they are at max. They are doing everything they can to produce everything they can. Another aspect of global hunger is that we waste food by feeding our crops to animals. Think of animals as food factories in reverse. For every 100 grams you feed a cow of protein, only 10 come out as beef. 90% of the protein is wasted. 90% of the protein is wasted in a world that's short of food. For every 100 calories, um, you feed a cow, only four calories comes out as beef. Why is this so? Well, the cow uses the, the, its nutrition for its own purposes, to constantly rebuild tissue, to generate heat, to keep its body temperature. It, it's eating and existing for itself, not for our benefit. So in a hungry world, this is really, a, they talk about not wasting food, and there is food wasting. Uh, I would submit to you there is no greater waste of food than to feed it into a farm animal. For every uh, person that lives on a Western meat-centered uh, diet, 12 people could receive excellent nutrition. So it's 12 for one. And the math here is, is very simple. So this is really a major factor. And in some parts of the world, it's not even poverty as much as what's driving this. In some, it's been uh, calculated that even in the poorest parts of the world, they would probably be able to feed themselves if they stopped growing and raising livestock because they're wasting their, their, their crops. I will add only in passing now with the war in Ukraine is a major grain exporter and that is not coming out. There was an agreement, um, but it wasn't honored. Um, and so that food is stuck there. Some is coming out overland, but I think they're only getting 15% out. And so now the world food crisis is even more severe, which makes this diagram here even more important. Okay. Stuart, we need to we need to move on a bit faster. Can you um, compassion can you... for animals? I'm in, from New York. I can talk fast. Okay. George Bernard Shaw, the famous British playwright, said, "Animals are my friends, and I don't eat my friends." Simple as that. You know, we love our cats and dogs to smithereens. I'm a cat person. I'm crazy about them. Uh, and dogs, and they're cute, 
Um, but did you know that pigs, though, maybe not as cute, are just as smart and sensitive as dogs are? Isn't it kind of arbitrary which ones we eat and which ones we take into our homes and love and take to the veterinarian when they're sick and this and that? While other animals, just as sensitive, live under extremely harsh conditions and meet a terrible end in the slaughterhouse. Over 90% of the farm animals raised in the U.S. are raised in factory farms. You might drive down the road and see some sheep or some cows grazing. That's part of the 10%. 90% are raised on, on farms where the animals are crowded in, as you can see from these pictures. These pictures are not extreme examples. This is the way things actually are. Um, and it's inhumane. It's unsanitary. And I will mention, since it's flu season, flu influenza is a zoonosis, which means a disease caught from animals. If we stopped factory farming pigs and chicken, we would not have influenza epidemics and pandemics. And our article on this has been published in the Journal of Infectious Disease. So, this is this is yet another way of um, that raising animals hurts our health and the health of the planet. Also, it's cruel. Those chickens don't even can't even turn around, and they'll spend their entire lives that way. Okay, it's just um, and if their food were necessary, if their meat were necessary for us, if it was us or it's them or whatever, we could begin to have a discussion, but it turns out that our meat-centered food system is unhealthy for us and cruel to them. Everybody loses by this uh, situation. Oh, I love the Beatles, and yes, I'll brag. I saw the Beatles when they first came to the United States in Shea Stadium in 1964. I'm dating myself here. I am a baby boomer. And uh, Paul McCartney famously said, if slaughterhouses had glass walls, we would all be vegetarians. I will also add very quickly that working in a slaughterhouse is considered the most dangerous job in America. And the workers there, many of whom are undocumented, um, have get the worst uh, treatment. It's, it's, we wrote an article on this. It's um, really horrendous the way the workers are abused. And I will also mention, while I'm talking real fast, the fishing industry has an actual slavery problem, and we've written about this as well. Not harsh treatment, slavery in Southeast Asia. Here in the 21st century, slavery. I would have hoped we had gone beyond that. So the, the workers, the animals are suffering, but the workers are suffering too. And here you can just see a summary that these, this is the healthiest diet that you can get. And it's true for grandma and grandpa, for mom and dad, for the teens and the tweens and the toddlers. And it's especially true for pregnant people. So um, again, uh, the health information, not only on lower rates of heart disease, diabetes, and other diseases they don't talk about as much, such as overactive and underactive thyroid, ulcerative colitis, breast cancer, prostate cancer. Um, it's, it's a very major factor. The American Medical Association says that diet is the number one risk factor for disease and disability in the United States. And the researching medical world has come to this conclusion very strongly. It takes time to make it into clinical practice, the same way it did with with cigarette smoking, uh, it took time be between the results of research and um, public health measures. Uh, lactations, this is it. Um, in terms of strength and everything, consider that uh, vegans owe, owe, excuse me, hold a disproportionate number of Olympic gold medals. Last I looked, we held the world record for weightlifting. Seven, Edwin Moses got seven gold medals in track and field. Vanessa Williams in tennis, 
it just goes on and on and on. So people wonder, oh, you're missing this, you're missing that. Really? Why are we doing so well? Uh, well, how about your intellectual development? Well, Newton, Einstein, Da Vinci, they were vegetarians. They seem pretty smart to me. So again, uh, don't let fear get in the way. Okay, what do we recommend as a healthy diet, a good way to go? And of course, consult your doctor before making any changes in anything. Uh, first is water. We have a food, not a food dish, but a food bowl because people are not drinking enough water and that strains the kidneys. Chronic kidney disease is a big problem in the United States. It takes up 20% of the Medicare budget. But we think the largest proportion should be vegetables, actually. Uh, e roughly equal amounts of fruits and whole grains and legumes, legumes being lentils and beans and peas and so forth. Nuts and seeds. Um, the health value of nuts, such as walnuts, I'm not talking about peanut butter, that's really a legume, not a nut. It's just been so overwhelmingly proven again and again and again. It, it's, it's, it's pretty well established. Herbs and spices can be healthy. And yes, you can have uh, some oils. Uh, we, you know, plant oils are low in saturated fat. Um, butter is 80% of uh, saturated fat. Canola oil is 7%. You can do the math difference is enormous. Sure, have some sweets once in a while is a treat. The only vitamins we recommend are vitamin B12 and vitamin D. Well, the vitamin D is easy. Look where we live. It's cloudy and we live lifestyles where we work inside and we wear plenty of clothing, uh, even during the warmer months. Ordinarily, we would make vitamin D through our skin, but in modern life and in the cloudy Northwest, um, that doesn't happen so easily. So we suggest vitamin D and vitamin B12. Why do we need vitamin B12? I get this question a lot. Uh, most people get their vitamin B12 from animals, but they don't stop to think where the animals got their vitamin B12. Vitamin B12 is produced by the bacteria in the soil. The cow lowers its head, pulls out the grass, eats the grass, the roots with the dirt attached to it, and it gets. And in old days, people would pull a potato out of the ground or carrot, kind of shake it. And, you know, they would eat plenty of dirt with their plant foods. But nowadays we wash it and then we skin it. And with that goes the B12. Now, there's a lot of, we're not living under uh, natural conditions the way we might have been 100,000 years ago. So you really do need to wash the produce. And because of that, you need vitamin B12. So to sum up, and I hope I did not go over. Uh, why does this keep happening to me? We protect the environment. We make food available for the hungry. We express compassion for animals. We nourish our spirits. We add years to our lives and, li and life to our years, and it's easy to do. And Amanda's going to show you how. Thank you, Stuart. <laughs> if you could stop sharing the screen, that would be really helpful. <laughs> there we go. Okay. So, so we're now going to talk about how to change your diet. And for... I can't believe I did 40 minutes. <laughs> Well, I I'm think so it was sorry. a little less than a little less than that, but <laughs> um, so a, a lot of Stuart has talked about um, the need to have um, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes, and those are the four main food categories that we uh, include in a vegan or plant-based diet, and we encourage you to eat um, from the natural foods as much as possible, whole foods, which means like they came out of the ground or off the tree or whatever, rather than highly processed foods. You know, a little bit of processing is okay. You know, applesauce, when you look at the ingredients, you can either get a jar of applesauce that's just got apples in it, nothing else. Um, and 
that's minimal processing. Or you can get an, a, a jar of applesauce that's got all kinds of additives and sugars and things like that. That's more highly processed. So we really encourage you to look at the ingredients um, on every package and buy things as, as close to nature as possible. Um, so a lot of people, when they're first changing, wonder what on earth can I eat? And so I thought I'd just talk through a little bit and feel free to put any questions in the chat or, or even just unmute yourself and ask questions. That would be fine, too, with me. Um, so I encourage you to um, think about that and we will talk about breakfast. So what do we eat for breakfast? Um, most of us probably eat cereal of some sort, and I would recommend eating um, oats just because they are a whole food, um, they are unprocessed. And if you buy the um, minimally processed uh, quick cook oats, you can just basically add some hot water. You don't even need to cook them. So that makes a really, really quick oatmeal. And you can add um, nuts and seeds and fruits. Um, I like to use frozen berries, frozen blueberries are wonderful. Um, a little bit of coconut, a bit of mixed nuts, um, maybe some applesauce to sweeten it up a bit. And, and that makes a really nice um, oatmeal. So I pretty much have that every day. And then also I, um, I usually make a smoothie every day. And smoothies are very easy to make. If you just have a nice good blender, you can take a banana and some um, maybe a kale leaf and some frozen fruits um, and blend it up together. You can add some protein powder if you feel like you want to get some extra protein. Um, there's pea proteins and different vegan protein proteins powders that you can get. Um, and that makes a, a wonderful smoothie with just a bit of water. You don't need to add yogurt or um, anything else. Or you could add some, um, some tofu. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but <clears throat> That, that basically is my breakfast every morning. Um, if you like to have a more cooked breakfast, you could do a tofu scramble or, um, or tempeh bacon. I'm going to show you how to make tempeh bacon. Um, now, in the, um, the lunch, I, I often have carrots and hummus. We make our own hummus, but um, you can certainly buy hummus. Um, it's a great way to have a, a tasty dip. Um, I use hummus as my main spread on sandwiches as well. So I don't use butter or anything like that. And that helps to cut down the fat intake. Um, and hummus's prime ingredient is garbanzo beans. So it's a great way to get some legumes into your diet. Um, I see that somebody's saying just egg is awesome. Yeah, just egg is a product that is a good egg substitute. So there's, a, there's many different ways of substituting for eggs, but if you want to have something that's as much like eggs as possible, then um, you can buy a bottle of this liquid egg, uh, egg substitute, and, and you can just pour it, make omelets and uh, scrambled egg and things like that. Um, you can also use tofu. You can, in baking, you can use mashed banana to replace eggs. Um, you can use... Um, some, there's some other egg products out there too, uh, vegan egg products. Nutritional so, yeast, Amanda, you might want to mention that. I was going to talk about nutritional yeast um, when I talk about dairy products. Um, <laughs> nutritional yeast is, um, I have here, um, it's a, a yellow powder or um, it comes either as flakes or powder. You can sprinkle it just on popcorn or something like that. You can sprinkle it on the top of anything that you would put um, like a, use it almost use it like a parmesan cheese it's got a very it's a denatured yeast and it has a, a very cheesy type of flavor so and and one of the dishes that i like to make um regularly is just to make a parmesan cheese substitute by grinding up half a cup of almonds with half a cup of nutritional yeast so you first of all you grind using um a little nut grinder like this one. So this is actually a coffee grinder originally, but I'd never used it for coffee. I use it for grinding nuts for the most part, and it just fits half a cup into the container here. So you can grind up half a cup of almonds, um, add half a cup of um, nutritional yeast, 
and then add a little bit like half a teaspoonful of salt and half a teaspoonful of onion powder and half a teaspoonful of garlic powder and you just stir it together and you you've got a wonderful uh, parmesan substitute which you can keep in the fridge and shake on all kinds of different dishes to add some flavor so that's a great cheese substitute um as far as um, using legumes, this is the biggest issue that people are confused about when they change their diet. If you're used to having meat and potatoes and vegetables, then what are you going to replace the meat with? And the best thing to think about is replacing the meat with some sort of legume product. So legumes, like Stuart mentioned, are um, lentils and beans. And um, one of those beans is soybeans. And so soybeans are made, can be made into all kinds of different products. Um, edamame is um, a, the, the most natural form of soybeans that um, are very nutritious. And you can buy frozen edamame in the, um, in the grocery store and keep them in the fridge and add them into salads and various different stews and things. Um, if, you, if you process the soybeans a bit more um, in a kind of, cheese making kind of way, you can make tofu. So today I'm gonna to make you, show you some tofu and how to prepare tofu. So tofu comes in two different ways. Um, there's the, the kind you might've seen before, this is one brand. Um, there's many different brands available. This is called House, House Foods. There's um, other, but they always come in these plastic tubs with some water to keep it fresh. So that's a regular tofu. And then the other type, type of tofu is um, called silken tofu. And silken tofu often comes in, um, in these aseptic packets, which you don't even find in the tofu in the refrigerated aisle. You can find them in the Asian food section. So near the soy sauce, um, because this type of tofu, it, because it's in an aseptic packet, this packet, for example, lasts until October, 2023. So you can buy packets ahead of time, keep, keep them for a long time. Um, and this type of tofu is best to use in um, when you blend it into creamy types of things. You can make puddings with it, desserts, chocolate mousse, uh, pumpkin pie. You can add some to um, a smoothie and make it a thicker smoothie. And it's, it's very high in protein. So that's you, a useful way to get some extra protein into your diet. Um, and it's, it's very versatile. So I always have a couple of packets of this in and use it for a lot of different things. So this type of tofu is the type that, that you can use best for cubing. So silken tofu is best for smoothies and creamy things, but it doesn't cube well. When you get it out, it kind of shears off and mashes up. Um, if you want to do cubes of tofu, you use this type of tofu. So I'm just going to demonstrate here on my chopping board um, how, to, how to prepare tofu. So the first thing you do is cut around the edge of the wrapper and drain off the water. So I'm just going to do that in the sink. Once you've drained off your tofu, you can um, cut up the tomato and turn tofu onto your chopping board. And then what I like to do is just cut my chop, cut my tofu into six slices. So I cut in half, and then this is going across ways across the slab, and then in uh, two more slabs on each half. Just cut through. And then, so tofu has um, different soft firmnesses depending on how much water it's holding. And so if you have, if you buy extra firm tofu, that's the one with the least water in it. And that's gonna have the strongest consistency. Sometimes when you go to like a Thai restaurant and you have a Thai uh, a tofu curry, uh, you'll find really soft tofu in it. And some people like that consistency, but many people like a firmer consistency. And if you want it to be even firmer, and you want it to be able to absorb various marinades or sauces and things, then you, you want to press out as much of that liquid as possible. And so what I suggest you do is just take some sheets of paper towels and lay them out. Let's just do it here so you can see what I'm doing. So I just lay the 
three slices across the paper towel and then roll the paper towel up into, so I've just got a strip of, of paper towels wrapped around the tofu. And then do the same with the other three slices. and roll it over. And then sometimes people press, press the tofu with cans and other things. I just press it out with my fingers a bit so that the water absorbs into the paper towels and less in the tofu. And then you can unwrap the paper towels and get the slices out and then restack them like this. And then you can just take your knife and cut if you've got your, your slices horizontal stacked like this, then you can just cut into eight pieces by doing four, four slices that way and one that way. And then you've got your cubes. And you can put your cubes into a bowl here. Um, you, could add, you could add your cubes straight into a, a sauce. That would work great, like um, a Thai curry sauce or a, um, an Indian curry sauce. Um, or some tomato sauce or something like that. It's great as a you know, substitute for meat or for cheese or um, like paneer in Indian cooking. Um, so I'll just take off the others. Now then, then what I like to do is, if I'm just cooking it from scratch, just like this, what I would do is sprinkle it with soy sauce. So um, I like to use this tamari soy sauce. It's a Japanese brand of soy sauce that's um, a bit more natural than, than some of the other brands that you get. Um, it still tends to be a little high in salt, so look for a, a reduced sodium um, soy sauce. So I put it into this bottle just because this is a really handy bottle for sprinkling soy sauce, but I'm using that brand. So what I do is I take my tofu cubes and sprinkle the soy sauce and then, you know, let it marinate for as long as you've this depends on how organized you are. If you're doing this ahead of time, you can let it sit for a while and let, let the, the uh, soy sauce soak in. But to be honest, I'm usually in a rush. I usually start thinking about it about six o'clock and think, oh, it's dinner time. What am I going to eat? So I um, just soak it around in the, in the soy sauce for a little bit so that it's covered. And then you want to just, um, you can just fry it then. So the easy way to do that is have a large, skillet like I have over here. And I usually just spray it with a bit of spray oil. This is a canola spray oil. Um, and if you've got a good nonstick pan, that would be plenty. You don't need to over, over oil things. So I'm just gonna spray this and tip in my tofu cubes. We'll just let those, let those fry for a little bit. And then once you've cooked your tofu cubes, you could use them in all, all kinds of different situations. Um, like I said, if you're doing a sauce, um, you can very easily uh, put the, the cubes straight into the sauce. But if you want to have some tofu on the top of like a rice and, and stir fried vegetables, then, um, then you can just have the cubes or you could use the cubes um, just as a snack and eat them, nibble them as you as you go. So I saw a question about tofu that you didn't end up pressing out and draining. So if you want to store tofu that you haven't um, used, there's, you can buy um, a pack of tofu like this that's actually divided into two. So if you're, if you're living alone and you don't want to get through all the tofu at once, um, you can you can buy pre-separated tofu, but if you've got too much tofu, and so these slices, for example, if I, I wrapped up, what you could do is just put them back into the container and cover them with water. So the most important thing is just cover it with water. Um, if, you've, if you've used this type of tofu and you've only used half of it, um, always put some water in to stop it from drying out and then just put it back in the fridge. And then you can keep it for a couple of days or so. Um, I wouldn't keep it much longer than that, but um, some people say you should drain the water every day and replace it and things. Usually I just keep it a couple of days and try and use it up, add it to a smoothie or something. So 
So that's now another another way that you could use these slices would be to dredge them in um, soy sauce and then dip them into a, a mixture of flour and nutritional yeast and onion powder and garlic powder. Um, so you can just make a mixture and then kind of basically bread them. Um, and then you could put them in the oven and uh, bake them for uh, 20 minutes or so. And that that's a really it's kind of like makes tofu steaks then. So you could have that with with your vegetables. Um, maybe some um, just with potatoes and steamed vegetables or whatever. However else, you could put them into a burger um, if they were cooked like that. So that would work quite well. I also wanted to talk to you about uh, tempeh. So tempeh is another soy product. And uh, that's a, it's uh, you can see the what the product looks a bit looks like quite clearly there. It's made from um, Tof uh, soybeans which are fermented into a cake it's actually the traditional food of the Indonesians so whereas tofu is generally associated with Chinese or, or Thai or um, Japanese cuisine um, tempeh is um, Indonesian and it's it's firmer than tofu quite a lot firmer so I'll show I'll show you what it looks like when I cut it open here so it comes in a packet. One of the really good things about tempeh is that you can keep it in the freezer. Uh, so tofu, if you put it in the freezer, it changes the texture of it. So you don't want to, uh, if some people like that texture better, um, but many people prefer it sort of to have the texture that it comes with. So, um, so personally, I don't put tofu in the freezer at all, but I do keep tempeh in the freezer all the time. And then when I need it, I can just get it out, sit, let it sit for a little while or defrost it in the microwave or something, and then um, use it for cooking. So I'm gonna show you what this is like. You just need to um, dig into the plastic wrapper to get the wrapper off of the packet. So this is what it's what it's like out of the wrapper. Um, you can see the soybeans in the in the cake of it. So it's it's more um, more of the re the whole soybean, uh, whereas tempeh tofu is more like um, it's been made from soy milk that's been uh, a bit more processed. And what you can do with this is you can crumble it. Um, actually, putting it in the food processor would be would be one way to crumble it quickly. And then you could marinate it in some soy sauce again. Um, and that makes a really good meat substitute. You could add it to spaghetti sauce or something like that. But this also slices really thinly. So I like to make uh, tempeh into tempeh bacon. Um, so what you do is you just put, put it on your chopping board, slice it across ways very thinly. So maybe more, just um, less than quarter of an inch wide, very thin slices. And you can cut it, cut it across. You can also cube um, tempeh and you can, um, again, marinate it in soy sauce a little bit and then um, put it in the oven. And that makes really good croutons, which you can uh, make, make makes quite crunchy croutons that you could sprinkle on the top of a salad or on top of some soup or something. Um, so that's another way to get some protein and using tempeh. So I'm just going to slice half of this packet for now. I'll put the rest back in the fridge. Um, and I will just put this in a, in a Ziploc bag before I put it in the fridge so that it doesn't dry out too much. So to, um, to make it into bacon, let's just finish off our um, tempeh cubes here, the tofu cubes. So just toss this around a little bit. You basically want to uh, toss the tofu until it's brown on all sides. We have a question. Uh -huh. um, have you noticed a change in restaurants as far as willingness to offer vegan or vegetarian alternatives? I, I think around here, um, pretty much all the restaurants have some sort of vegan option. Um, 
I can't think of many restaurants. There's one actually right near Magnolia, the, the fish restaurant that's down at the bottom of the cliff there. I forget its name, but that one, you know, fish restaurants tend to have a lot of fish dishes and they often don't have a vegan option. Um, but apart from that one restaurant, I really can't think of many restaurants I've been to in Seattle area that haven't had at least one vegan option. Now you might be pretty limited in your choices and there are some wonderful vegan restaurants and vegetarian restaurants that are just, just vegetarian foods. So um, certainly I would have a preference for those. You know, you can get sandwiches and um, vegan burgers and things in the, um, some, uh, there's Veggie Grill. There's a couple of branches of Veggie Grill downtown. Um, there's one over in the U Village as well. One and there's um, Arias, which is a good Thai restaurant chain. There's a few branches of that that are all vegan. Though of course, there's the classic vegan rest vegetarian restaurant Cafe Flora over in uh, Madison Park, and uh, Plum Plum Bistro is is a really good um, restaurant as well. That's up on Twelfth Avenue in Capitol Hill. So there's some good ones around and, you know, pretty much any Thai restaurant, any Mexican restaurant, you can always get, um, you know, veggie enchiladas, veggie, veggie fajitas, um, bean burritos. There's lots of choices. Um, so ethnic restaurants are always a good way to go. Um, but, you know, you can have a pizza. You just ask them to leave off the cheese and have a veggie pizza. Um, so or, or many pizza restaurants these days have veggie cheese available. A vegan cheese so there's a lot of choices out there let's not forget for the first time in washington state history now up on first hill is the first all vegan jewish deli <laughs> um yeah there are you know that ever since i moved here 25 years ago there's always been some vegetarian and vegan restaurants and there are more i would say there's more that are, are purely vegan these days so that's really good Have I missed any questions? I'm just looking for the name of that deli. Oh. I'm going to, so I just want to show you, um, I, I haven't fully cooked these, but I want to just show you what the cubes look like. So that they're, they're getting browned. The more you cook them, um, the, the, the browner and crispier. You can also um, air fry. If, you're, if you have an air fryer, that's a really good way to do total cubes. So that's that's kind of fun too. So I'm just going to uh, also cook a few of these bacon, veggie bacon slices. So all you do is, having sliced it really thinly, is place it in the skillet and brown them in the same way. Probably could use a little bit more oil here. Let's just spray. The name of the deli is Ben and Esther's. So you can sprinkle um, like basil and um, thyme and oregano onto the slices of um, so-called bacon. Um, and then at the end, we'll sprinkle soy sauce on again. And um, that would be good. So sprinkle a little basil on. So um, the other the other way to include more protein in your diet, um, well, cutting out meat is just to whatever you normally cook, um, just add beans. So you could use canned beans like these ones. Um, you can add you can you can use a can of chili even. Uh, you can buy lots of vegetarian chilies, vegan chilies, um, or you can just use beans or lentils from scratch. So these are green lentils. Um, they cook up pretty well in 20 minutes or so. So those add some really good texture to a lot of different dishes. You can make a lentil loaf or um, um, add them to a stew or um, burgers. You can make lentil burgers. Um, and another kind of lentils are the red lentils. 
Um, and these ones cook down into, into a mushy texture. So those are better in stews just to add thickness and protein. Um, you can make a, a dal, you know, Indian dal um, with these. That's, that's my favorite dish to make. Now, if you're using a lot of beans, what I recommend is you use beans from scratch as much as possible. It saves all the cans and the waste. Um, it also um, avoids any extra salt. So I, I have containers of all kinds of different, I have garbanzo beans here. These are dried garbanzo beans, and these are dried black beans. Um, and what I do is I cook up about three cups of dried beans, they cook up to maybe six cups in total. Um, and then I keep them in these plastic containers. So this is like cooked garbanzo beans. And I just put them in the freezer. And then that's ready to to add to um, or to use for this. This one I use a lot for um, hummus. So I, I put them in three cup containers um, and uh, keep them in the freezer. But the black beans, I tend to keep them in smaller, like one one or two cups. And then I just add them into dishes as I go. So um, the tempeh bacon here, you just toss it over a bit, keep it, and then we'll add the sprinkle the soy sauce on it. We will get the plate out. So these are our tempeh bacon slices. I don't know if you can see those. I'll try and get the lighting better here. Um, obviously, if I had had a little bit more time, I would do them for a little longer. You can cook them as long as you want, and they'd be crispy. Um, so um, bon appetit. They're very tasty, and you can put them in sam these bacon slices in sandwiches. I love to have pita pockets that I cut in half and stuff with lettuce and bacon, uh, these bacon slices or tofu cubes um, and various other vegetables, red pepper slices and things like that. It's a great, great lunch. So I hope that's a, a brief introduction. Does anybody have any more questions about different foods to eat? What kinds of dishes you might um introduce into your diet in order you know one, one of the ways I would recommend you do it is take one of your dishes that you love right now and um, think about what you could substitute in for you know if you're if it's a chicken dish for example you can buy a chicken substitute um, which the, the meat substitutes are amazing these days there's so many different choices out there um, you can buy a lot of different ones you can get chicken style ones you can have beef ground beef style um, meat substitutes and so do experiment and try some of those meat substitutes that are out there there's a few ones that aren't so good so be willing to experiment and and that's a really good thing about veg fest is you can come and try a lot of different types of food there um, so substituting in um, a different meat substitute is one way to go removing the meat and adding in beans is another way to go um, sometimes some dishes just work like pizza for example it's best to just leave the meat off and just just have a veggie pizza once in a while um, so that's that's one way to do it and then and then as you get more confident you can look for more recipes um, there are we we've done over 30 cooking classes um, which are all available online maybe Stuart you could post the link to um, your health classes and the um, the cooking classes that we have from if you go to our website that pull pull down on the classes tab there's a couple of pages that have all of the links to all of our classes that we've given and they're all online classes so we've recorded the videos um so lots of recipes there you can also if you have if you have a, a new ingredient that you want to try just google vegan and whatever the food item is vegan eggplants if you've never tried cooking eggplant before find a recipe that sounds interesting to you and, and give it a try 
we, re we really encourage you to experiment, but just proceed, you know, at your own pace and do the best you can. Um, switch over one recipe each week. And as you gradually um, switch over, you'll find that you can have more and more of your recipes be, be vegetarian or vegan. I see a question about vegan cakes. Um, vegan cakes are uh, an art and um, there are some different ways of doing it. Yes, they don't include eggs. Um, often they, they might use bananas as, instead of eggs um, or tofu can be used. Sometimes it's just baking soda that gives some, some lift. Um, but yes, they don't tend to be quite as light and fluffy as um, the fat and sugar and egg based cakes that uh, most of us eat uh, or have eaten as birthday cakes and things in the past. So um, experiment. There are a lot of vegan recipes out there. Um, they, they do um, make a lot of things like cakes in different ways. And you really have to experiment to find out what you like the best. So anybody got any other questions? No, <laughs> that's a lot to, I have not switched over. So a lot to think about. <laughs> yeah. What do you think would be the most challenging for you? Giving up beef. Uh-huh. Well, there's two of us here. So a meat and potatoes guy and, and me. <laughs> yeah, sometimes, sometimes the partner is, some, is the most challenging. I'm just gonna show you a packet. Um, I'm going to grab from my freezer. Chris, we went um, meal by meal. So we, we started with breakfast and then we moved to lunches and now we're working on figuring out dinners. Well, we can do breakfast because we both like, the, she's named our breakfast, yep. which is it's either raisins or um, blueberries in oatmeal. So yes. we're, and it's the steel cut. It's not the finely processed. Mm -hmm. So yeah that sounds good yeah and and you might want to substitute um like an almond milk or oat milk or something for your I, that's dairy. all we use my husband can't have lactate so oh. we use almond milk exclusively mm -hmm. yeah that's great yeah so so it sounds like you're well on the way for breakfast that's not a problem <laughs> um so i would recommend you know sneaking in some of these types of products like um, a meat substitute like this yep. um, into, uh, instead of using ground beef. And, you know, it, it looks pretty much like ground beef. It's pretty easy to um, convince people that, <laughs> that it's, it's just the same. So, so that's a good place to start is the meat substitutes and just give them a try and see if you can find ones you like. Um, well, I appreciate you showing everything, how to use it, how to touch it how to cut it, cook it, because I, that's always been the off put for me is just seeing it in a package, this square blob of, yeah. yeah. Although I do know that it absorbs, it's kind of like um, uh, water chestnuts. It absorbs whatever flavor it's being cooked with. So yeah. it's really not too off putting in flavor. So, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. The people say, oh, tofu is so bland. Well, it's just down to how you cook it. You know, mm -hmm. you don't you don't have to have it bland. You can soy sauce adds a lot of flavor and that's by far the easiest. But, you know, there's a lot of other marinades, barbecue sauce you can use. And I um, appreciate other... knowing how much the, the water content makes a difference for mm -hmm. when you soak it. So if it's yeah. a, a firm, it's going to take up more fluid than. Yeah. Yeah, and then if you press out the water um, even mm -hmm. further, then you've got a, ch a better chance of getting more of the flavor into it. Good luck uh, with it. Uh, Amanda, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna probably call us. We're at 8.15 today. Mm -hmm. So um, I wanna say thank you on behalf of those of us who are, who are on the line and those of us who are gonna be listening to this on the recording really really helpful information so thank appreciative you. and um Stuart thank you for those links and I can share those as well when we share the recording so I will copy those and make sure we get those out and does it have the do you did you post the veg fest details too 
Uh, we can do that. Yeah, it's um, on the same website. It's um, there's a tab specially for VegFest. Okay. Okay. If they go to Veg of Washington, everyone will find everything, right? I'm going to yeah, post yeah, it right it's now. All oh, okay. Thank I'll you just, so much. Um, give me one second okay. and I'll have it very Thank fast you. for you. And there you go. And there's Veg Thank Fest. You. Thank you so much. Okay, everyone, thank you so much for coming tonight. Amanda Stewart, as wonderful, as usual, wonderful thank content. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck.